I believe that gods and goddesses are created or are. I define them as three different things. Um, one of them, and because I just talked about the Egyptian netters, is again. Um, let me let me let me tell it to you like in a story. <laughs> let me get a, let me get a sip of my my Fanta. I get one soda a day, so I'm having it right now. Um, imagine. Imagine a river, just a beautiful flowing river, and next to the river there's a rock, and the rock kind of protrudes over uh, the river and creates like the shade. And because of the shade, um, plants are able to thrive. So the plants begin to grow around the rock. Uh, suddenly, uh, because of the water and because of the plants, we have uh, small animals coming to eat and get shade and get water. And that, of course, you know, the bigger animals are going to come eat the smaller animals. And imagine that you come come along this river rock with all these animals around it. And, you know, think back 100,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, whatever, before we developed uh, language and whatnot. Imagine that you're uh, an ancient person walking by and seeing this and going, wow, look at that. You know, all these animals are coming around that rock. It must be special. There must be special something special about that rock. And because of the curiosity and wanting to connect with that rock even more, we begin to give it a personality. It's like, oh, well, that rock must be a god of the river. Oh, no, it's a god of nature. It's a, it's a god of, of, of growth and food and nourishment, you know. So we begin to ascribe it personalities. And then the next thing you know, you know, we have 20 villagers hanging around the rock and doing rituals and ceremonies. And eventually, and now I'm going to go into the metaphysical aspect of it, is eventually what happens, actually, let me change that. What happens when we continue to give um, focus to one particular thought form? Um, what we give our attention to comes alive, right? Everything we give our attention to comes alive. So imagine if a whole tribe of people are focusing on this thought form, eventually over time what happens is we basically create an astral or etheric life form. Uh, we ascribe it consciousness, we give it, uh, we give it personality, we give it all types of you know human characters or qualities so for me, um, one way of creating gods, or perhaps even defining what gods and goddesses are out there, are a multitude of people focusing on this one particular thought form, and the thought form literally comes to life uh, in the ethers, the astral, you know, whatever, the other world, another dimension, perhaps. So that's one way that I, I, I sense or I define gods and goddesses. The second way is that they are already existing on another plane of consciousness, that they are um, transdimensional entities, for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, I can't help but wonder, you know, the, a, a great example is like the God of the Bible, this Yahweh. Uh, was Yahweh a, a being that lived in the ethers and somehow connected with Moses and Abraham? And so they created, you know, this whole religion around this one uh, tribal, for lack of a better term, tribal or um, geological uh, being that lived in another uh, plane of consciousness. So they could be, you know, just trans-dimensional entities or whatnot. Um, another way, and actually I have several definitions of how gods and goddesses can be created, uh, but another one is the idea of the ancient aliens. You know, were they and it's almost like the trans-dimensional thing. Were they beings from another world that came here? And, and you know, a great example of that, if you've ever seen the movie Stargate, I love that movie. <laughs> it's a great movie, great idea, great concept, great uh, collective unconscious mythology to think about uh, for us here as uh, humans on this plane of consciousness. But were they like beings from another planet that came down and people were like, oh my goodness, you know, they are, they are the gods, you know, whatnot. Thank you.